We're talking today with Dr. David Preston, a high school teacher whose students are hacking the curriculum. So, so David, where do you teach and, and, and what, what grades do you teach? I teach at a comprehensive high school on California's central coast, about halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And this is part of a, a sort of a long odyssey for me. I came back to teaching high school after uh, teaching at UCLA and running a consulting practice in Los Angeles. And part of the reason that I moved to this area was that I had experience in the urban environment, um, but I'm also aware that there's consensus on the problems about education, but not on the solutions. So I wanted the whole spectrum. And I live in a semi-rural community where there's a healthy mix of uh, agriculture and emerging business, but it's, you know, the typical heartland. So what do you mean by hacking the curriculum? I, I know you've got a lot of projects going. Why don't you just tell us about some of the things that, that your students are doing? Well, in the beginning, it was all about learning the Internet itself and recognizing that digital natives aren't necessarily digital experts. So we wanted to go through the affordances. I used some of your infotension curriculum and mind amplifiers curriculum to begin with. And very quickly, the students moved into blogging. We had uh, about 100 students with about 100 blogs. And they used that not only as a means of self-expression, but also to establish themselves in the digital world. They all were fairly unaware of how commodified their information was. And the only way to get out ahead of their profile and establish who they really are online is to get up front and say so. So the blogs began as self-expression. So are those, those blogs are visible only to the students? No, all of this is visible to the entire public on the Internet. Uh, one of the things we began with was uh, very carefully educating students about privacy and security and also why adults are reluctant to uh, play because there's so much unknown about this technology for my generation and older uh, that legislation is misunderstood, policy is misunderstood, and there are a lot of people who are very reluctant, as you know, about letting students online. But everything that we've done is available for viewing by anyone who goes online. In fact, the course blog now has about 90,000 page views. And, and it's worked out and there haven't been any problems? Zero. Uh, the very first thing I told students was we're not going to have an acceptable use policy or rules. We're going to treat this like any other organization in our culture that has a vision and uh, organizing principles organizational values and you know this is all easy to make go away with two mouse clicks if someone has a problem and I think the students are aware of that um, but I didn't have to push anyone into this this was more like I felt more like a, a guy with a crowbar at the top of the bottle with the genie inside they all wanted to pursue this uh, some of them took longer to trust in the process because they had been made promises by teachers in education before and they were a little reluctant on that side but once they embraced it, uh, everyone gathered momentum and away they went. What about the research flash mob? How did that work? The research flash mob was, uh, it came out of an interview that William Gibson did with the Paris Review. And in talking about illusions and other literary principles that guided authors, um, I made the comment in class that it would take me or anyone else a week to three weeks to thoroughly research every reference that William Gibson made in the article but that together we could probably knock it out in about 24 hours. And I didn't know, but it was a good guess. Um, and so we did a strategic planning process. The students created roles and a way to go about this. We chose, uh, we introduced the concept of a mind map, and then I asked students to choose which user interface they thought would be most appropriate for the project, so they had to go out and review products. And once we settled on a platform, I gave everyone editorial control. Uh, so 95 people had the ability to contribute, delete, and modify. And within 24 hours, we had uh, a, a mind map on MindMeister that explicated the entire interview. Uh, you mentioned that you had a, a, a student teaching online security. What, how, how did that come about? What was that about? Well, you're going to meet Ian in a few minutes here because he's going to talk about the peer assessment project that they created. Oh, great. Um, but one of the things that comes out in this process, for me anyway, and, and this is where we get into things like social production, there are so many students that are invisible in their courses because traditionally the operating values in high school are you stay out of trouble and get through and graduate so that you can start living your life. I learned through this process that so many of my students had these hidden talents, whether it was graphic design or coding or things I hadn't even predicted would be relevant. Um, and Ian was one of those students where he, he had sort of floated through his curriculum and he'll tell you more about that. But he had also a uh, hacking experience on his own, programming experience on his own, and knew a lot about internet security and privacy. So since he had been operating in that sphere for longer than I had, I wanted the expert in front of the room and I asked him. 
And the reason that we reached out to so many people like you and Roy Christopher and Corey Doctorow is going to be with our class in November is because I really wanted the students to have firsthand experience with the thought leaders in the field and the people who had more experience than not. I know that I've Skyped in uh, with your class on occasion and you are taking full advantage of the networked uh, capabilities that, that you've got. Um, tell us about bringing Roy Christopher into the class and, and, and how that worked, or bringing the class into Roy Christopher. How, how did that work? What was that about? Well, any opportunity to talk with someone became an invitation to the course. So, for example, when I assigned a paper from a professor that I found online, I also sent that professor an email inviting him to talk with the students on the blog, and he did, and it was wonderful. Uh, Eli Pariser, when I taught about filter bubbles, I also sent him an email and he joined the conversation. So I think at one point it might have even been through Ted and you and Mind Amplifiers that I originally met Roy, um, but as soon as I learned what he was doing on Remix and how he was looking at the culture and the emerging talents of people and how they could contribute to curation, that was an automatic. So I was really excited when he said yes and, and the class really got a lot out of it. Uh, he's also doing a follow-up. And it was so engaging that some of my seniors last year were disappointed that they would miss out. We've now created an alumni community forum that's growing, and everyone in any other alumni community is welcome to join us as well. But they'll all be coming back for his talk in the fall. What's this I hear about your students setting up a, a microfinance fund with uh, strategic partners in Africa? How did, sounds, that, how did that come about? That sounds very advanced, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And that sounds good when you say it like that. Yeah. Um, we started looking at ways of, of creating peace. This started two years ago with a group of students who just wanted to have a peace club. And they wanted to look at ways of reducing conflict and empowering people around the world. And that sounds like a lofty goal, but you know the nice thing about high school is that that's when you still get to have lofty goals and you're still enough of an idealist where you don't know all the things that can go wrong and so you try it. And so one of the things we talked about was that mothers around the world, specifically, have uh, traditionally not had economic opportunities that would enable them both to sustain their families and in some cases their entire communities, but also to reduce conflict because they're reducing scarcity. And the students connected that immediately to school because the conversation around education is all about scarcity, what we don't have, what we have to compete for. So they wanted to look at ways of creating a multiple and leveraging what little they had. 20 bucks here buys you a couple movie tickets maybe if you're at a matinee, uh, in some places around the world that can feed a family for a month or start a business. And so we looked originally through Kiva at starting micro-investment and then expanded once we got to know some of the NGOs locally. We partnered with uh, a wonderful man named Valence Lutaser uh, from Uganda who's got an organization called Yofafo. And now we're expanding and looking at other opportunities for next year. What do you mean after you got to know the people locally? How did you, how did you go about that, doing that? It's, you know, between social media and social engineering, it really is a small world after all. And it turned out that another colleague of mine uh, who just came to the campus this past year had been volunteering in Uganda. And when she found out that we were supporting some people, it, it actually, as it happened, was we were supporting people through investment on Kiva that lived just miles from uh, this gentleman's NGO in uh, his village. And so when my colleague heard about this and she had been volunteering and taking groups of students, uh, she had him here on a visit. I was able to introduce him to my classes. He came and spoke uh, personally, and that's how we created the relationship. Um, also, uh, on my list of all of the things that you've done with your students, I've got one about a, a, a professor who wrote an essay on Hamlet, and you somehow drew him into the plot. How did, how did that work? Uh, this was also an example of, of uh, I found an article on the performative utterances in Hamlet, which was completely brand new to me. Uh, you know, one of the, the most fun things about coming back to teach high school is I'm reading a lot of things that I kind of skimmed for the test the first time around myself, uh, and I'm learning the literature in a new way. And this essay caught me sideways because it had a lot to do not only with Hamlet's goal-setting process and, and self-fulfilling prophecy, but also the way our minds work. And all of my seniors, obviously, are at a moment in their lives where they're creating what's next for themselves. And the performance uh, in their own minds is telling themselves what's going to happen next and then acting on it. So I assigned the essay and then sent an email to the author saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if you could join our uh, students in a thread on the blog? And the nice thing about that was any academic paper is written so formally that it gives students an impression of the author that may not be accurate. So when he came onto the blog and said, 
hi guys, I'm the author of that piece and wow, it's pretty amazing what you're doing and talk like a normal human being, I no longer had to talk about voice or narrator. It's all right there. Well, what do you mean when you say that the, you have had the students remix your, your curriculum? One size doesn't fit all. And my biggest problem with standardization is that learning isn't standardized. You know, when you and I leave this conversation, and at least I will go through my own mind and think of all the great things I should have said to you in this conversation, that's learning. Uh, but even neuroscience hasn't managed to account for the firing between axon and dendrite that gives us that little voice. And it's messy. And so I don't know that an MLA paper is the best model for communicating knowledge transfer. One of the things that I've done this year is given students license to tell the story in their own way after they've learned how best to do that on social media. So if they can represent a concept with a mind map, for example, more effectively than a paper, I want them to have that option. It teaches them not only the platforms and the technologies and the affordances, but it also gives them a view into their own mind and how they best communicate and receive information. Now, I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. They still do papers and essays, and, and a lot of these students were preparing for an AP exam. So the core components are still there, but this gives them so much more flexibility, and more importantly, or at least just as importantly, it gives them a sense of agency. This is not a one-to-many broadcast anymore. This is now a network where every node literally has as much authority and responsibility as every other node. So as they're putting all these things online, not only do they get to have the creativity and ownership, but they also have the transparency and accountability so that when someone comes to them and says, well, what did you mean by this and why did you choose this? They know that they have to have an answer and it's not just to an authority figure for the sake of a grade. It's to appear for the sake of providing value. Okay, so I know that, that next um, I'm looking forward to talking with one or two of your, your students. I've got two here. Trevor and Ian are, are behind me waiting for action. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to talk to them about um, the peer sure. assessment. So can you join I'll us on this? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ease off to the side and put them at center stage. Okay. Hi there, welcome. Great to talk to you. Would would you like to introduce yourselves? Uh, yeah, I'm Ian May. Uh, I graduated in 2012 and I took Dr. Preston's senior class. Um, Congratulations. So I'm Trevor Hudgens and did the same thing. So I understand that you came up with a, a system, what educators call a rubric for self-assessment, for peer assessment, for students doing their own assessment. Tell, how did that come about? And how did you go about doing it? Um, originally, uh, we called the project Project Infinity. Uh, it started, the idea started a long time ago. Uh, well, Project Infinity itself, the name came from this kind of idea where we get philosophers and thinkers together to talk online in a kind of social hub, but we didn't have time to do that, so we kind of just let the name go. And then uh, earlier in the year, I had the idea of kind of gamifying uh, Dr. Preston's class and adding a points system and ranks and roles and creating a community out, kind of outside of school uh, where the work we were doing in the things that students were doing could give them points and that could be shared. Uh, so towards the end of the school year, we created Project Infinity um, where both groups and individuals could kind of join the game. And, <laughs> I'm sorry, and um, so the groups and individuals can join the game and by making some sort of progress or being productive got them points. But the whole idea was to create uh, a community. Um, the individuals, uh, it was okay, there was no penalty for individuals working in the group, uh, or working in the, uh, in the game, but to get more points and get to the top of the leaderboard, they had to collaborate. There had to be some sort of participation with uh, a network of students. And that's what ended up happening. Um, Project Infinity itself, uh, when we made the site, I needed a graphic for the top. 
and I went around and looked for students, and there were several. I, I'm not an expert in Photoshop, and I had some people that you know knew their way around it, and uh, they created a graphic for me, and that was the first real like collaborative effort for Project Infinity, was the actual site itself. What? Uh, how did you deal with the issue of collaboration? As, as I'm sure you know, when you you get students to do collaborative projects, it's always a kind of a problem grading them because. Some people do all the work, and some people do none of the work, and and uh, that doesn't really enter into the, the the grading process. How did you deal with that? Uh, a lot of the group work was uh, crowdsourced. Uh, we, I uh, contacted it personally because I was kind of the the administrator for the website and the game and everything. Uh, I would contact other members of the groups uh, as kind of not really the leaders, but as the tributes that the groups kind of selected. And um, we would determine how to score group work, how to delegate points to people. And uh, the reason I tried to get everyone involved is because it would be, even if I was, uh, you know, I wasn't attached to the groups in any way, I still would have a bias. So I would get everyone's opinion, and we would come to a consensus of what the group deserved for whatever progress they made. Uh, so you brought the issue of the, the the problem of assessing collaboration out into the into the conversation and and, and yeah. had people talk about how they were going to collaborate and who was going to do what. Yeah, uh, to to get into the game, you had to show progress. You had to have some sort of artifact of what you've done. So there was no way of just kind of skating by. Uh, you wouldn't get points. You wouldn't be a part of the game. You wouldn't be included in this whole system if you hadn't done something. So I'd like to hear from both of you, uh, particularly about what advice would you give to other students out there uh, about if, if they have a, a teacher who is as willing as Dr. Preston, what would you advise them to do? What was it that you did that you found the most exciting uh, about um, hacking the curriculum in, in Dr. Preston's class? Well. I guess it was just the freedom to be able to actually do what you want because especially for seniors in high school, everyone's thinking about the next year and going to college because everyone has the idea that when you go to college you get to do what you want. And so um, I think we, we were given the freedom, especially within the collaborative working groups and like the big questions to kind of research what we wanted and use our class time to do something to our interest. Whereas we're going here and we're going to do what this person tells us to do. Um, so I think that was really important. Plus, we could um, bring technology. Uh, so many classes exclude cell phone use. Um, teachers always think you're texting or something ridiculous when uh, you could be checking your email. Um, things like that. And we can actually bring a laptop, which is pretty much forbidden in like every classroom. Uh, especially, uh, only like science classes sometimes have them, but they're like in a big freezer with like a box safe, and then you're like, oh, you get computer nine, and you gotta return it, and they're all, um, you know, like blocked and filtered. Um, so it's just, I think what was important was uh, the freedom and like lack of restriction, and just uh, if you did something bad or made a fool of yourself, uh, you know, public shame, because. That's Everyone's important. just going to laugh at you. I mean, it's just um, you know, embarrassing yourself. So yeah. I think, and in high school, everyone's self-conscious, so no one really wanted to do that. It sort of ordered itself that way, where everyone knew that once it goes online, it kind of stays online, and you make your profile. Uh, so once you make that footprint, everyone knows, and everyone can see it. So, you know, it's not as, the, the fear of people, well, whatever they would fear, yeah. kind of went away when they realized, you know, everyone's going to see this. I, I, you know, I'm glad to hear that uh, from you, this uh, awareness that once you put something on the Internet, it's it's there forever. I think that that's something that not everybody knows. And it th sounds like your your class is pretty well informed. Did you teach each other? Did Dr. Preston teach you? How did this all come about? I think that was more of a combination because we started off with a lot of help from Preston and I think um, just kind of like the first semester was sort of like an enlightenment period to everyone because not everyone came in uh, with this mindset 
a lot of, I mean, we have that stereotype of digital natives, but a lot of people just stick to Facebook or something, you know. It, the, as far as, like, how big the Internet is, people tend to, you know, pick habits and go to their favorite places, so you kind of shut off, so not everyone has the whole spectrum in mind, so I think it was sort of a combination of peer-to-peer, -peer because, like, Ian knew a lot about computers and the social media and security, so we learned a lot from him, but then other people knew other things, and then Preston showed us a lot of stuff, so uh, it was just kind of a group effort. With the, with the teacher not so much being an authority figure, but being a collaborator. collaborator. Well, f fantastic. And I know a lot of uh, educators and other students uh, around the world are going to be really interested to, to see what you have to say when this is published. So I thank you for your effort. I wish you great luck in the near future. I'm sure you won't need luck. You are on your way. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.